Okay, yeah, so thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce myself again. I'm Paulino de Flores Bañuelos. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about Pedro Padamo by Juan Rulfo. It is a Mexican novel. I will say it is the Mexican novel. It is now nowadays regarded as, uh, as the emblematic um, piece of literature for 20th century uh, Mexican literature and still to this day, it is very much um, the novel that really uh, encapsulates what Mexican culture and what Mexican um, people talk, um, think, um, relate to each other. Uh, even though it is very much um, a ghost story, so nothing that happens in it, or not a lot of things that happen in it actually happen in real life. Still, I would will, I will say like a lot of Mexicans can still see us um, in the narrative still to this day, even with all the modern um, developments that have happened in the last few decades since its publication. Um, sorry, before I go to Juan Rulfo, I'm just going to mention why I'm talking about Pedro Padamo. Um, it is one of the novels that I analyzed for my uh, master's dissertation. So that's um, the first chapter of my master's dissertation was on Pedro Padamo and about the, the, the Gothic elements um, that we can find in the narrative. Um, I will say for people who, I mean, for all of us that are here, um, we know what the Gothic is, we explore the Gothic, we see the Gothic probably everywhere. Um, that's not true for a lot of people in Mexico, I will say, especially when, when talking about Pedro Padamo, I think there's still a lot of um, um, a lot of defensiveness about um, regarding what's the place of Pedro Padamo in literature. So it is either regarded as a magical realist novel, um, which is something that uh, Latin American people, of course, are very proud of. Um, but I will say in the in the scholarly research in Mexico and Latin America, it is still very rare to to hear the Gothic attached to Pedro Padamo. Um, so maybe for a lot of people, it's like, oh yeah, the Gothic and Pedro Padamo, that that's evident. Um, that's not the case everywhere or for everybody. Um, so I'm just going to start. Um, by talking a little bit about Juan Rulfo, he led a very interesting life. Um, and I think that informs a lot of, of, of course, that informs um, what he wrote. Um, his full name was uh, Juan Nepo, Nepomuceno Carlos Pérez, Pérez Rolfo Vizcaino. I struggled with that name, uh, even though I have a, a large, um, a long name my, myself, but it's, it's a struggle. Um, he grew up, he was born in Apulco, Jalisco in 1917. So he was born still in the midst of the Mexican Revolution. And he lived um, during the Cristero War, which is a, which is a separate um, conflict in, in Mexican history. I will not talk about uh, these events later on, uh, but he basically grew up in, in a very... Um, conflicted era in Mexican history. Um, there was um, there was a lot of war, there was a lot of death. Um, actually, his, his father died, I think two of his uncles died. So he was um, left in an orphan from a very young age. Uh, he will later on lose his mother to a heart attack. He will go on to live with his grandparents who will send him uh, actually to an orphanage. Uh, which he described, which, which Wolfers described as, as a, a correctional, so more like a prison than an orphanage. Um, so he, he grew up in very precarious situations in a very abusive, what we can imagine was an abusive um, environment um, in this orphanage. Uh, he would go on to move to Guadalajara to study law. Um, he will uh, he will found a literary magazine with two other writers, um, but mostly um, his literary career will be very short. Um, he will work in other in other fields, such as um, he was a travel salesman. He I think working in the aduana. Um, so he did a lot of things. He was a photographer. He was a screenwriter. 
um, but he will consider, I think he, he mentioned that in an interview, he will consider um, his writing career, not a career in itself, but more of a hobby. Um, so really, um, what we have of his work is just, um, just because it's still very relevant, very important, but it's very short. Uh, so we have uh, his fierce uh, published work, which uh, was The Burning Plane. It, it is a collection of 15 short stories that he published in 1953. He will go on to publish per Pedro Padamo in 1955. And there is an um, unfinished uh, novel that he wrote that's called The Golden Cockerel. Um, it was first published before he died in 1980. Um, but it will be revised and it will be corrected and republished in 2010. Um, so really, his his work is just really short. It just consists of one novel, one unfinished work, and one collection of short stories. It's seeing the relevance that it has for Mexican literature, for Latin American literature, is really big. Um, I was just looking for quotes because there are a lot of... of as you can imagine, there are a lot of authors and a lot of thinkers and a lot of people in general who, who have um, talked about him and, and his importance. Um, I just selected two, like quite randomly, because there are a lot of there is a lot of praise uh, about him out there. Um, Octavio Paz, uh, another poet and, and writer, um, Mexican poet and writer, will say that. Um, Juan Rulfo is the only Mexican novelist to have provided us with an image, rather than a mere description of our physical surroundings. Um, Emir, uh, Emir uh, Rodriguez Monegal will call Pedro Padamo um, the, pro the, parody, the parody of the new Latin American novel, a work that takes advantage of the great Mexican tradition of the land. The novel transforms it, destroys it, and reconstructs it. Um, so really, it is very hard to overstate the importance of what Juan that Juan Rulfo had um, for the development of of what will become uh, 20th century Mexican literature and what will become like the image um, that the world has of 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 Mexican literature. Um, Susan Sontag will talk about him. Um, uh, Gunter Grass will call him the, the the father of the Latin American novel. Uh, Juan Borges, uh, Borges will call him the, the, the great Mexican nar nar narrator and, and even Gabriel Garcia Marquez will thank him in, in a way for being an inspiration for a, a hundred years of solitude. So really, he, he really changed what um, not only Mexican literature was, but what Latin American lit literature was with his work. Um, even though I, I think it is Gabriel Garcia Marquez who, who says it is only 300 pages that we have um, of rural forest writing, uh, but those 300 pages are are certainly something like of, of value for, for Mexican literature. Um, there are two major events that inform the narratives, um, not only Pedro Padamo, but his other work, and that's the Mexican Revolution, which lasted 10 years. Uh, between 1910 and 1920, and the Crucero War, which started a few years later, uh, it will only last three years from 1926 to 1929. Um, and I will go on to explain a little bit about these conflicts because they are important, of course. Um, they are very, very long to explain. So I will just uh, concentrate on, on some few details. Um, so the conflict in Pedro Padamo, um, the first one um, that's that's really um, important to keep in mind is the Mexican Revolution, and this was fought against the dictator Porfirio Diaz, uh, which had which had ruled Mexico for thirty years, a, a little over five days, um, thirty years and five five days. Um, so the Mexican Revolution essentially ended the period that we now know as El, El Porfiriato, like this period that Porfirio Diaz governed. Uh, the first president um, to assume um, the government of Mexico was Francisco I. Madero, and he only governed for two short years, less than two years. Um, and he was assassinated um, 
there were a lot of casualties. There were, the, it is estimated that there was between one and two million casualties. Uh, and one of the ideas that's really relevant to understand Pedro Paramo is, is the legacy of this um, phrase that Emiliano Zapata and other revolutionary leader um, will, will, will defend and will kind of fought for. And it's, it's the idea that the land is the property of those who work it. So instead of how, how things have worked in, uh, on, their, on their El Profeyato, um, only the rich uh, will get any benefit from the land, while the, the the hand workers will get nothing, and they will often abuse, often live in poverty. Um, they work long hours. They were again completely abused. So Emiliano Zapata really defend this idea that the land should be um, the property of those who actually um, do the work. Um, this is something that will again be important um, a few years later in, during the Cristiano War because there was a lot of dissatisfaction with um, with the with the way that the social reforms and the agrarian reforms had worked after the the Mexican Revolution. Nothing, or at least not much, had had changed for for people. Even if they got land, these land were often um barren were often unworkable so there was a lot of dissatisfaction and this dissatisfaction finally um will erupt between in a conflict between the state and the church um the and this conflict was a consequence of the constitution of 1917 which included uh which added a, a lot of anti critical laws um to to the government to to the way that um that people could, that the clergy could exert its power um, over the population. So really the, one of the main, um, uh, sorry, I, I lost my, my train of thought. One of the main uh, goals of, 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 of the state for, separ for introducing this, these laws was to um, really eliminate the, the social and the political and the economical power of the church. Um, they will introduce a lot of um, a lot of reforms, some of which was um, priests will no longer enjoy any special status. Uh, the number of priests will be limited in, in certain areas. Marriages will only be civil, they will not be religious. And particularly, and most importantly, the, these reforms sought to, to eliminate the church from, from education. So they sought a, a really secular education. Obviously, the church didn't want that. So um, fears, out of fears, the, the, these anti-critical laws were not um, really enforced. Um, it was after the presidency of Plutarco, it was during the presidency of Plutarco Elias Calles in 19, that started in 1924, um, that this will be enforced. There were a lot of expulsion um, of, of, of priests. Um, and this finally led the Mexican Episcopate to suspend all public uh, worship, to suspend the, the sacraments. Uh, in 1926, and this was done as a way to to really make the public, make the population to actually raise in arms against the state and, and, and really kind of force them, because obviously for the both Catholics, the sacraments are really important. So um, this really make a difference in how people um, will respond to, to the anti-critical laws that, that the government was trying to enforce. Um, this war will end on June 1929, and it will lead about a quarter of, um, a, quarter of a million dead. Um, so again, a very bloody, um, a very bloody conflict. And just as a way of having some visual, um, visual representation of what um, the Mexican Revolution and the Cristero War was. Uh, in the first map to the to the left, we have just some key key battles that occurred during the first year of of the Mexican Revolution. That in itself, it's it, it's a very big area that these conflicts will take place, and that's only the, the first year. 
um, and you kind of you you can see where where the conflict was um, was um, more concentrated in a way. Um, in the Crusader War, we have um, a more central and western ranges of the country that were embroiled in, in this conflict. So really Michoacán, Jalisco, Guanajuato, um, and Colima. And of course, we, we now know that Juan Rulfo uh, was born in, in Jalisco. So this conflict really affected um, his way of life. Um, Again, just to see on, on, on the right, um, there's a map of all the different groups that were fighting during the, during the Mexican Revolution. So really there was not only a divide between the people and the government during the Mexican Revolution, but there were um, a lot of ideological divides in itself um, from the people. Uh, so we will have Pancho Villa, again, we will have Emiliano Zapata, and there will be a lot of a lot of movement in that respect. It was a very fragmented um, society at the time. Um, again, some visual representation, just because um, these two conflicts will really shape the image that I, I think the world still has of of, of Mexican culture and, and the Mexican population, the the sombreros, uh, the rifles, um, the shawls. Um, I, I I think they still they still. Um, are preserved in in the in the image that the world has of, of Mexico. Um, I find this this photography really hunting from the Civil War. This this family of soldiers uh, that were not soldiers; they were just like regular people that were fighting um, for Jesus and, and the Virgin Mary. Um, so now we finally get to to Pedro Palma. Uh, again, it is regarded as, as the Mexican novel, right? Um, it starts with a very known um, uh, opening line. I, I will just read it because it's, it's, it, it makes something to, to a Mexican heart. Um, so it says, it starts by, Vine a Comala porque me dijeron que acá vivía mi padre, un tal Pedro Padamo. Mi madre me lo dijo y yo le prometí que vendría a verlo En cuanto ella muriera, la apreté sus manos en señal de que lo haría, pues ella estaba por morirse y yo en un plan de por prometerlo todo. And this translates roughly to, um, I came to Comala because they told me that my father lived here at certain Pedro Padamo. My mother told me, and I promised her that I would come see him when she died. I squeezed her hands as a signal that I would do so. She was about to die. And I, and I felt like I could promise anything. So it starts, so the novel starts as a, as a search for identity and as a search for, for a parent, for a lost parent. Um, so we kind of have this mythical start um, to the novel. From then on, we will quickly realize that this journey that, that the main character, um, this is Juan, Juan Preciado speaking here, um, this character in search of a father will not, in fact, find a father. He will find uh, a, ghost, a ghost town. He will find ghosts. Um, when he arrives in Mexico, in Comala, um, the place that, that he has to visit, um, her mother's, his mother's hometown, um, he is quickly told, oh, Pedro Padamo is already dead. So th there's no point um, to, 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 the, to the journey anymore. Um, but what, what he will find is, is all the secrets that are still laying, laying on the ground, laying on the time. Um, so very important to know, um, Pedro Padamo is set in the town of Comala in rural Mexico. This is not a real place. There is a real Comala in, in, in a different state in, in Colima. Uh, but the Comala is, is a... Juan, Juan Rulfo's Comala is a fictional town, and we know it's in Jalisco because he mentions other uh, real places such as Contra and Sayula. Um, but Comala is very much a fictional place. Um, the novel is told in two different storylines. So we have um, this storyline, this uh, Juan Preciado's um, journey in the present time, right? But we also have a lot of in interjections from the ghosts that he will find um, that are talking from the past, that are really living that past as, as, as is happening in the present time. So we really have 
um, the past and present colliding in, in a certain way. Um, what we will find in, in Komala is a quasi freedom society. So we have a cacique, we have a landowner um, that we find in the past um, that we um, um, use a lot of force, he will be a despot. Um, he will send to kill people just to get, um, get their land. He will rape people. There are a lot of stories about um, his actions to to get um, to to a power to a place of power. Um, it's still he 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 retains a sort of, uh, of authority and respect from all all around them. That that it it's it's just mesmerizing to read. I think. Um, but yeah, through through these different storylines, we are kind of. Um, pass on together the story of Pedro Padamo and, and what happens to Juan Preciado once he comes to, to Kamala. So again, just essentially what Juan Preciado finds when he comes to Kamala is just a ghost town. It's, it's, it's brighted, it's hot, um, it's really a hell. And there, there's a very um, um, quote that, that explains it. Um, and it says, that place sits on the corners of the earth at the very mouth of hell. I can tell you that many of those who die there come back to get a blanket after going to hell. So what what we get uh, immediately when we come into this story is just the, the mouth of hell, right? Uh, and I think this is very telling, uh, this is very important when we talk about um, the Gothic in Pedro Padamo, because um, a lot of um, gothic narratives, classic gothic narratives, are set in, in in a totally different environment, right? And in the north, in northern Europe, uh, it will be cold. There will be castles. There will be forests, um, primordial forests that are um, kind of um, just everywhere. But we, what we have in 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 Komala is just desert, desert. You know, it's just um, nothingness, it's just barrenness, it, it's this very um, architecture of poverty that, that's really telling of, of, of the pain, the trauma that, um, that people go through in, in this town. Um, so according to Juan Rufo, um, the main character in this novel is the town, and he will say a ghost town, he will, he will describe it as a ghost town inhabited only by souls where all the characters are dead, even the narrator is dead. Therefore, there are no limits between space and time. The dead do not have space or time. They do not move in space or time. In the same way they appear, they disappear. And within this confusing world, it is supposed that the souls are the only ones that will return to the world of the living. It is a popular belief. Um, so I, I, again, um, Sorry, I again lost my train, my train of thought. Um, we are uh, immediately uh, set on a place with no boundaries, not even in space, not even in time. Um, there are they live on top of each other. So when when Juan Preciado comes um, arrives to Kamala, um, he's welcomed by the ghost. That they and they do not know they are ghosts because they are not conscious that they are not living in the past and that they are not um, that there that there is a different present now. Um, so it is a very confusing narrative in that sense as as we try to piece together um, what's happening and and uh, what's real what's not real who's a ghost who is not a ghost. Um, in in this sense, um, those who live in who, who live, they are not living; they are ghosts. But those who lived in in Kamala, um, and the and the and the narrative voices that we will hear from is Juan Preciado, which we already we already met. Um, we will hear from Pedro Padamon. He will we will hear from Susana San Juan, who will be the last wife of Pedro Padamon. Um, and she will be very important in the narrative, even if um, the actions that she 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 has during the narrative are not 
really active. She's more of a passive character. But what she says in, in her interjections, it's, it's really important too. We will also have the, 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 the ghostly voice of Dolores Preciado, uh, Juan's mother, and Pedro Padamos, fierce wife, uh, in the background. Um, in, in the editions, uh, I suppose in the English edition, it's, it's, just, it's the same case, but we won't have this voice in italics. So it, it comes and goes in the narrative, like with no warning. Um, so it, it's a ghostly voice that kind of Juan Preciado is haunted by. Um, and we will also have the voices of the townspeople who, who will meet with uh, Juan Preciado, not knowing that they are dead, just um, kind of welcoming him. Um, and they will tell their own stories and they will, again, uh, bring more pieces to the person of who Pedro Padamo was uh, and what happened to the town. Um, so what we have in, in Pedro Padamo is a secret kind of narrative. And Juan Rulfo, again, will say that Pedro Padamo does have a structure, uh, but it is a structure woven with silences, loose threads, and fragmented scenes, where everything unfolds sim simultaneously in a known time. Um, and I think um, this, um, this fragmented narrative um, is one of the, the, the elements that really make this a gothic narrative. And I will say that, um, and I say this because I, I think this fragmented narrative makes the novel be a structure in conflict. Um, as the ghosts of Kamala kind of interrupt each other and push each other off of the narrative to tell their own tales of woo. Um, perhaps in an attempt to confess in a very Catholic sense. Um, they are trying to come to Juan Preciado and confess their own sins. Um, uh, this creates a kind of fragmented structure that it's in line, I would say, with the, the, the this stabil, this stabilizing nature of the Gothic. Um, the Gothic is that which disturbs and the Gothic novel is plagued by disturbances. And I think that this is what's happening in, in this um, fragmented scenes that we have from different ghosts and from different characters. Um, it is very, very stunning too. So one, we will have Juan Preciado having a conversation with someone um, and all of a sudden we'll, we will get a memory from, from Pedro Padamos um, past. And in the force of a frame, uh, narrative boundaries and, and the Gothic novel, um, Clayton Caroline Tarr will suggest that it that this is the the this is at the heart of the dynamics of the Gothic narrative. Um, something that and, and this is something that provides, according to him, uh, a foundation for realist, uh, aesthetic realism. Uh, and he will say, perhaps it is not a comfortable uh, realism with respect that with directs us towards claims of objectivity, but it is a realism based on human experience, the often disturbing, sometimes horrifying reality of per perspective and truth and doubt. Um, so again, what, what the narrative is doing is creating this space in which everything is confusing, in which the boundaries between uh, reality and 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 the nightmarish or the supernatural in which the boundaries between past and present, between um, who's dead and who's not, uh, are really confounded. And, and this creates a sense of, 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 of confusion that's really gothic and that, that really makes uh, Juan Preciado get that sense of terror that is at the heart of, of the gothic. Um, I will say that this comfortable realism goes hand in hand with the aptness of the Gothic uh, to deal with taboos, because during these narratives and during this very natural way in which in which the townspeople will speak of, of what has happened, of all the crimes, of all the horrors that have happened in this place, um, they they both they, they give voice to a lot of 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 the taboos that you won't hear otherwise, except from goats, those who have nothing to lose in a way, and that have only salvation and sense of confession, confession to 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 attain salvation, um, that gives them sort of power to speak of these taboos. Um, 
and Judy Newman um, drawing from Eve Kosovsky Setwich um, positions that uh, in Gothic narratives, stare knowledge may be shared, but it cannot be acknowledged to be shared and is there, therefore shared separately as the barriers of unspeakableness separates those who know the same thing. So I, again, I think that this, um, these fragmented narratives and these kind of goes pushing each, each other out of the narrative um, to get the attention of Juan Preciado makes make make this um, uh, this dire knowledge that cannot be shared uh, be voiced out loud and be be given a, an outlet um, that it's still horrifying for 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 Juan Preciado but um, reveals the truth of what um, of what what had happened to to Kamala. Um, and here I will just make a, a brief um, a brief pause to to just mention that I, again drawing from the mar magical realism um, our argument that this is a magical realism novel. Um, I will say that um, in magical realism, as we know, um, that which is fantastical, that that which is magical, the the magical, the supernatural element. Um, is integrated into the world, in, into the world of the characters. So there's no surprise, there's no terror that arises from it. It's something that it's considered natural in 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 the world that we are uh, set in. Uh, and I will say that this is not the case in Pedro Palamo. And uh, again, uh, it causes something disturbing. It, it is horrifying um, knowing that these are that these are ghosts. Um, and again, it, it causes confusion between what's what's true, what's not, uh, what's reality, what's what's a nightmare, what's an hallucination, um, and and yeah, uncertain. Um, and again, going back to to the fact that this novel is very much founded on conflict, um, I also find that the images um, that Juan Rulfo describes are very violent in nature and they also talk about a fragmentary a fragments not only in the narrative not only in the structure but also in the lives of the people and in in, in the in the way that these characters are constructed um so th this are very short scene uh in the memories of uh, pedro palamo uh, he's remembering when his father died and he sees her mother, um, his mother, uh, on the on the crying um, on the door of his bedroom, and he and the narrator says his mother was standing there on the threshold, ho holding a candle in her hand. Her shadow stretched up towards the ceiling, long and distended. The beams on the roof threw her back in fragments, torn to shreds. I feel sad, she said. Then she turned around. She blew out the candle frame. She closed the door and released her servers in sobs, which could still be heard mingling with the rain. The church struck the, the church struck, struck the hours, one after another, one after another, as if time had contracted. So I will say that this very violent description of human characters is also very much in line with um with what Gothic narratives um used with how gothic narratives will use female characters as a way to 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 place the violence somewhere and to fragment them to, to to dismember them as such um even if it is not in the literal sense in a very figurative sense um so what will happen after these memories is um pedro palamo will try to evict on memories of her mother um, but at the same time, while he re while he rejects this this maternal figure, he will become ravenous in his search for other female characters from for sexual partners. Uh, the first one will be Dolores Preciado, uh, Juan's Juan's mother, um, and this he does only to as a way to to obtain more land and to pay off his debts by marrying this uh, this woman. Um, later on, we will find out that he's very much abusing uh, the women in the town, as long with her other son called uh, Miguel Palamo. 
uh, who also rapes Guillaume's and abuses Guillaume's. Um, and finally, we will have the figure of Susana San Juan, who, who is a childhood friend of Pedro Padamo, who he, he keeps mentioning once and time uh, and time again in an obsessive manner, in an obsessive manner, um, a sort of, of, of an idealized um, female figure that he wants to capture and he wants to, to possess in a way. Um, so Susana San Juan has been described um, as a character, in a quote, whose entire discourse is one of memory and delusions, delivering from her tomb. It is the story of a woman forced to take refuge in madness as a means of protecting her in the world from the ravages of the forces around her, a cruel and tyrannical patriarchy, a church that offers no redemption, the senseless violence of revolution and death itself. Um, so I will say that, uh, again, Susana San Juan very much uh, personifies the figure of the mad woman, this, this object of desire uh, in Gothic narratives that, that either becomes crazy, is deemed crazy just because she's a female and she doesn't adapt um, to, to, to the necessities of the patriarchy around, uh, around her or around them. Um, and has to live in a world of, it, of its own. And again, it's very difficult to, to place where she is in her own senses and she is seeing ghosts, the, the ghost of, of her father, of the ghost of her ex-husband, of, of the husband who died um, before coming to marry um, Pedro Padamo. Um, but it is finally the death of this character that, that creates um, a disruption in, in, in the world of Kamala in, in the time of Pedro Padamo. And when she dies, uh, Pedro Padamo decides in an act of revenge against the townspeople who, who wouldn't observe, uh, who wouldn't um, display the same level of grief as, as he did. Um, he won't let the town starve. He will let the town um, died out. And, and the novel says, from that moment, the earth remained fallow as if in ruins. It was terrible to see it overrun with such infirmities and so many scourges which invaded as soon as he was left alone, and all because of the ideas of Don Pedro for the conflicts of his own. So in, in a manner very similar to a Gothic villain and, and in kind of um, uh, in this kind of um, influence that Gothic villains, so the characters in Gothic narratives uh, in general have over the land. Uh, once the object of desire is removed, it is as if, if a thread snaps and Pedro Padamo um, has a negative influence in the environment and in the landscape around them. And this is what finally brings uh, Kamala to its death. So this is the, the revelation of how uh, Kamala came to be a ghost town because Pedro Padamo was um, in an act of revenge against against the townspeople, she just let everything brought out and die out, um, and this is what finally makes everyone else ghost in this town. Um, just kind of to close off, um, there's there's this other quote from the novel. Um, ¿Por qué ese recordar intenso de tantas cosas? ¿Por qué no simplemente la muerte y no esa música tierna del pasado? Um, this translates to why um, this intense remembrance of so many things. Why not just that and not this sad music from the past? Um, and I think this this is the this is what informs all the narrative. This this traumatic response um, to everything that has happened in, in the town. Um, that creates this repetition over and over again of the lines of the ghost that they 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 cannot escape. Um, all the sins that they have committed, we have um, we have a pair of incestuous brothers that of siblings that live together in sin. Uh, we have a woman who, because he couldn't um, uh, have children, ends up. Um, uh, providing women to to Pedro Padamo's son Miguel Padamo, 
um, so he makes women available for, for Miguel to, to rape and, and abuse. Um, so there, there are all these um, lists of sins that these people in this town has committed that come back again and again to haunt them. Not only, um, not only Juan Preciado, who is the newcomer uh, in this town, but but they themselves. They are very much aware of of something that's not right, um, a sin that cannot let them rest. Um, so I, I, I think that this is the essence of, of the Gothic in the novel, this repetition, this dramatic repetition of memories and memories that have no order, that are just full of confusion, that are um, kind of set out in a, in a labyrinthine um, manner that we have to piece together. Uh, I, I will say that the novel is not, um, and, and many other people have said this, not, not just me, um, it's not very intricate. No, not, not intricate. It's not very difficult to understand uh, once we have um, once we have read it. But while we in it, uh, it is very confusing. We don't know what's happening. We don't know in, in which timeline we, we are. Um, and yeah, I, I will say that this is the essence of the Gothic, the, the 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 sense of confusion, the sense that there's not a resolution to to this um, to this supernatural thing that's happening in in this world. Uh, and finally, just um, because I I think it is um, uh, a quote that encapsulates the Gothic very well um, by David Ponter is exploring Gothic is also exploring fear and seeing the various ways in which terror breaks through the surfaces of literature differently in every case, but also establishing for itself certain distinct continuities of language and symbol. Um, and I will say that uh, what one rule for does in 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 Pedro Paramo is is again um, reinterpreting these continuities of languages, these symbols that characterize the uh, Gothic literature, that which which uh, instills terror and that which instills fear. Um, is this this sense of the uncanny, this sense of repetition, uh, this sense of, of, of the hunting um, that's happening in this world. Um, and, I, and I will just stop talking because I'm not making much sense right now. It's 3 a.m. right now. Um, but I, I think I will uh, hopefully explain everything that's not having, that, that's been misunderstood, or that hasn't been explained uh, yet. Uh, if you have any questions. So I will stop sharing my screen.